and welcome to Conversations with Matt DeLockery. In the last six episodes, we've covered 2,000 years of history and gone all the way from a Jewish man teaching in Palestine to the modern Greek New Testament. All of that is really cool, but unless we read Greek, it doesn't do us much good, does it? So how do we get from a Greek New Testament to an English New Testament? Obviously, we have to translate. But how can we make sure that what we're reading in English accurately reflects what is written in Greek? The first problem that we have is that there is not a one-to-one correspondence between language. It's not like A is 1, B is 2, C is 3. You can't just pull out your decoder ring and go to work. Words don't line up exactly. Words have what is called a semantic range. In other words, there are often many different things that a word can mean. There may be one meaning that is used more than another one, and so that's what we think of when we think of a definition of a word. But words can often mean many things. Take the English word run, for example. You can run a race. You can run a company. You can run for office. You can run a bath. You can leave a car running. Your nose can run. You can run into someone by physically colliding with them or by meeting them by chance. You get the idea. Most words have a range of meaning, and this is true in both Greek and English. So if you take a Greek word that has a range of meaning, and then you try to translate it into an English word, which has its own range of meanings, you can see how this is not always going to be a simple task. There's going to be some overlap, but it won't be exact. It's going to take some study and some interpretation to translate words from Greek to English. And every single word takes interpretation, and each has to be considered in its context. And this brings us to the question of how to translate. A lot of people say that they want a literal translation. They just want the Bible to be literally translated in English without any interpretation. The problem is no one really wants a translation to be literal. Here is a literal translation of John 3.16. In this way, for he loved the God, the world, so that the Son, the only he gave in order that each the believing into him, not he perish, but he has life eternal. So, would you really want to read the Bible like that? There's really no such thing as a literal translation. There do exist things called interlinear Bibles, which are just the Greek text with the English words beneath them, but they sound like that verse I just read. So besides the fact that you really wouldn't want a Bible like this, interlinears really aren't translations. They're study tools. Furthermore, while we might say we want a translation that doesn't interpret things for us, the fact is that that just isn't possible. Every translation is going to do interpretation. It's unavoidable. There's not always a way to say something in one language as we find it in another language, so by necessity, every translation will be just a little bit off. This isn't a Bible thing. This is just a translation thing. This is every translation of anything ever. So, since every translation will be a little bit off, we need to ask, in what way is the translation I'm looking at off? There's basically two options. Either the translators of a particular version will choose to err on the side of words, or they will choose to err on the side of meaning. A word-for-word translation is basically the translators trying to figure out what each word means in Greek and then finding the most appropriate word in English for that word. If a particular translation is word for word, you'll tend to get a pretty wooden translation. It'll be a little harder to read, but the Greek text behind the English version will be a little more transparent. You'll get a better idea of what the original language says, but it'll feel sort of like the translation is only partially complete. There'll be less explanation of what a particular word or phrase means, so there'll be a lot of things, like cultural differences, that will not be explained. And if you read one of these translations, you'll need to supply some of this understanding yourself. On the other hand, if a translation is focused more on the meaning rather than the words, then the translators try to figure out what a particular word means in Greek and then communicate that same concept in English, even if they have to use another word to do it. A translation like this will be easier to read, but it will be harder to see what's going on in the original language. More of the interpretation will be done for you, so you won't have to do as much work to understand what it says, but you're basically trusting the translator's interpretation. It's sort of a trade-off. So let me give you an example of how three different versions translate a particular verse. 
we're going to look at the first half of Romans 3.25. The ESV says, Whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. The NIV says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And the NLT says, For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You might have heard a bit of difference between how the different versions describe the sacrifice of Christ. The ESV calls it a propitiation. The NIV calls it a sacrifice of atonement. And the NLT calls it a sacrifice for sin. Each one of these translations is trying to explain Christ's sacrifice, but they do it in different ways. The ESV basically uses a word that you wouldn't know, propitiation, unless you had already studied it. It clues you into the fact that there's an important theological concept here that you need to look up and study. More fundamentally, though, it translates the word we find in Greek. The NIV uses a more familiar word when it calls Christ's sacrifice a sacrifice for atonement. It's something that you're more likely to understand immediately, but it also lets you know that you probably should study this some more. It translates the word, but it balances it with a bit of interpretation of the meaning to help the reader out. The NLT wants to make things understood more readily when it says that Jesus' sacrifice is a sacrifice for sin. It removes as much difficult theological language as possible so you can understand things without having to read another book first. It focuses on translating the meaning rather than the word. So when you place all three next to each other, you can see that each version has a different goal. And here we see sort of a spectrum, with the ESV translating the Greek word Paul used as best as possible, and the NLT translating the Greek meaning Paul used as best as possible, and the NIV somewhere in the middle. It can be really tempting to say that one translation is better than another, but if that's the direction we're going to go, then you really need to stop being so dependent on English translations and go learn Greek. Translations are different because people are different. The point is to find a translation that is right for you. So, which translation is right for you? This is really going to depend on what you both need and want. Personally, I prefer something that's going to do less interpreting for me because I want to do the interpreting myself. I will put in the work to understanding cultural context, reading commentaries, and other things that help me understand what's going on back then. Because I want to do the interpreting myself, I tend towards ones that do less interpreting, like the ESV or NASB. That's one side of the spectrum. Another person might really want a translation that does a lot of the interpreting for them, and so they might prefer something more like the NLT. You may not want to have to stop in the middle of passage you're reading to go look something up. Or perhaps you might want something that's more in the middle, in which case you might like the NIV. Take a look at some of the versions I mentioned. If you go to BibleGateway.com, you can put them side by side and compare. Maybe try reading something out of one of the Gospels and then something out of one of Paul's letters. Take a look at a few versions and you'll start to get a feel for which one you prefer. That doesn't mean, however, that you're going to be locked in for life. Just choose one for now and then go with it. However, when you're studying, look at a version that is different from your normal preference. If you like the ESV, take a look at the NLT. If you like the NLT, take a look at the ESV. It'll help give you a different perspective. Because the ultimate goal of all this is not to find a translation that you enjoy. Our enjoyment is not the point. Our understanding of the message of the Bible is the point. The question is, which version helps you understand that message the best? Now, speaking of messages, I need to make a brief comment about a particular version called the message. A lot of people who are familiar with the message have a pretty strong opinion about it, whether good or bad. Why? Well, you know how we talked about the spectrum and on one side you had more word-for-word translations and on the other side you had translations that are focused on trying to translate the meaning, which means they had a lot more interpretation? Well, the message isn't really on the spectrum. It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. It is a single man's effort to make the message, hence the name, of the Bible understood. It's a paraphrase combined with his interpretation. It is not a translation. Now, nothing I have said so far is controversial. These are just the facts. 
Whether you think the message is a good thing or not is another question. If it sounds like something you might like, you might take a look at it and see what you think. The only thing I would caution you about is that it's not a translation. You may find it helpful as a study tool, but please don't confuse it as a translation. If you're looking for a translation, try the New Living Translation, the NLT, that we've been talking about, and see if that's what you're looking for. But if you already have a translation you like, and you're looking for a study tool, you might find the message helpful. Now, we've been talking a lot about this translation or that translation. Really, though, the thing that will make these translations work better for us is to do our homework. I know, the thing that we all want to do. However, in every other stage of getting from Jesus to us, all the work has been done for us. Everything else in this series has been in the past tense. This episode is really in the present tense. It's about what's happening right now. With this final stage, the translators do a lot of work to produce good translations, but if we want to get the real meaning and understand what Jesus is talking about, we need to do our homework. Again, I know, the most horrible thing in the world. Basically, though, three things need to happen. One, we need to understand the original culture and what a particular passage meant to them. I think that more misunderstanding of the Bible occurs as a result of not understanding the culture rather than not understanding the original languages. People looked at the world differently back then than we do now, especially us Westerners. Listen to the series I did on Jesus' world, honor and shame, to see what I'm talking about. Two, we need to think through how a particular message translates into our culture. When Jesus said that you must love him more than your own family, what does that mean? When Paul wrote about meat being sacrificed to idols and whether a person should eat it or not, what was he talking about? And what does that mean today? Most of us don't go to the grocery store and have a moral dilemma because the ground beef was sacrificed to Apollo, and so we're not sure whether we're allowed to have hamburgers this weekend or not. What was the deeper issue, and how does that translate into our culture? 3. We need to apply the lessons to ourselves. The whole point of the stuff we're talking about is to make a difference in our lives. It's inherently practical. The reason people have put so much work over the last 2,000 years into making sure that what Jesus said and did was recorded accurately is because it matters. We're supposed to learn from it and change our own lives. It's really easy to read something we find in the Bible or hear someone talk about it and think, man, so-and-so really needs to hear this. Or, if my spouse, family member, friend, or coworker would just do that, they would be much easier to get along with. We regularly think about other people's faults, but not our own. We need to apply what we have learned to ourselves. The whole point of recording information about Jesus, compiling it, and translating it is so that it will change us. If we just deflect the lessons to someone else and don't apply them to ourselves, we've missed the point and wasted those 2,000 years of effort. The true last step of the process is not translation of the Bible, it's transformation of the individual. Though, as you no doubt realize, the transformation of an individual takes us down a different path. And that's another topic for another time. However, I will say that understanding the language is beneficial. If you're interested in learning Greek, There are a couple options for you. If you want to learn full Greek and be able to understand the New Testament in its original language, it's going to take you a minimum of two years of master's level classes. Sign up for a course at a seminary near you and get going with some professional level instruction. Some seminaries will teach Greek at an undergraduate level, but the classes are usually slower, so it may take longer. Some of you may think that's a really great idea. Others, maybe not so much. Never fear, there's another option. There's a book you might consider checking out called Greek for the Rest of Us. In this book, you will learn things like the Greek alphabet, how to pronounce Greek words, and how to do Greek word studies. Basically, you'll get enough Greek to know how to use Greek study tools and understand commentaries when they discuss things related to Greek. So you know, the man who wrote this is literally the man who wrote the book on Greek. He wrote the book that just about every Greek student seminary uses to learn the language, including me. And he happened to be on the committee for the NIV translation and was the New Testament chair for the ESV translation. I highly recommend the book. The man knows what he's talking about. So if you want to spend a few months to get better at Greek, rather than a few years, 
you should get this book and go through it. I'll put a link in the description for you. Well, that concludes our investigation into New Testament origins. We've taken a look at the major steps it took to get from a Jewish man speaking in Palestine 2,000 years ago to a book that you can hold in your hands, in your own language. It's been a long process, but I hope it has been helpful to you. If you've enjoyed this series, please share it with a friend. And if you haven't done it yet, please subscribe to this podcast so you can keep up with everything we're going to cover in the future. Thank you.